Hello and welcome back, of course, to Rambling Reviews. Uh, it's not... It's the same day. Um, I uh, usually watch the episode, let it percolate for a, sometimes up to a day, then I re-watch it, make notes, and record. This time, I guess my own enthusiasm for watching more of this show has pushed me to be a little bit... to sort of condense that process slightly. What I did was, um, obviously, watched um, episode two yesterday to let it percolate overnight, sort of did my notes this morning and rewatched it, and then recorded the episode that you you, you probably already heard. This one, um, I watched the episode straight after I recorded two, then I had like a couple of hours, um, spent some time with Nad here, watched some TV, like had lunch, and then um, I rewatched it again and made notes, and now I'm just gonna go, uh, <laughs> because I, I really want to watch episode four, and the only way I can do that is by recording this, so <laughs> um, you see the, the situation you've trapped me in, um, dear listeners, um, but I think it's a testament because I don't, I don't remember it being this difficult in previous seasons to sort of temper myself a little. Uh, it was definitely more difficult season two than season one, um, and, and this is, again, even more so. So I do think that the, another sign that the show's quality is improving. I think some of that might be to do with the fact that the show has this really f interesting ability to... Because it's building on a mythology, but it's giving us new characters and new stories every season, you're sort of in this interesting situation where you, you don't uh, you don't need to do as much setup as you should in an anthology show. Um, certain things are just sort of understood uh, because you've already seen the previous season, so it sort of likes to build on itself, which gives it more room to grow the character stuff. Like Tulip's story, in comparison to some of the stuff that's going on at the, in, in the show now really simplistic comparatively and that is quite simply because they had to they understood they had a balance right like they had to set up a mythology as, as alongside a character story so they kept it pretty simple um so that they could effectively tell her story alongside establishing the mythology the, the basic mythology is all established now so now it's kind of like about expanding on that in interesting ways and expanding on ideas but you're expanding ideas that you've set up in your previous seasons so you get to do as much character stuff as you want because the mythology doesn't need to take up as much time in an episode now <laughs> um i mean that's part of it there's like a hundred reasons the show is getting better as it goes um but I, that's definitely one part of it is that the, the the format of the show is genius because it really is a true have your cake and eat it too because traditionally you're just like oh i'll do the show serialized where wherever yet the season is just continuing the same story but oh, season two, season three, I've done all I can with these characters. That doesn't once you you have to complete their arc at some point because you don't want the audience to have no payoff <laughs> until the very end of the show. So you've got to have payoffs as you go, which means characters have to evolve as you go, which then leads you into this weird point where your characters have evolved as much as they're going to, and anything you do now is either going to be setting them back or repeating stories you've already done with them. It's why a lot of shows, I think, one of the major reasons a lot of shows suffer the further they go in. Um, but with this show, it's it's perfect. You know, they get to they get to <laughs> take you on a brand new character journey every season, but still continue to build up the mythology of this world. So you get because the other side of it is a, a sort of a, a you know an anthology show that gets to build up and pay off its its arcs every season. And this show is getting to do that too, but it's getting the added benefit of not having to reestablish new mythology every year. So yeah, it's it's very clever. Um, I've already talked about it, I think, but it just it continues to impress me. But today, of course, we're talking about episode three, uh, which is... Oh, oh, my computer has decided to have a tantrum. That's weird. One second. Sweet. Um... Totally forgot what I was saying. Oh yeah, debutants. The, de the, deb the debutant car, ball the debutant ball car, fancy dancing car is what I shall be referring to it henceforth. Um, so yeah, it's uh, this is the third episode of the series. It's probably I think the closest episode we're going to get this season to a traditional episode because it feels like what they've done this time, which is usually not the case, is they've sort of set up a situation that's kind of a time bomb. <laughs> like this, this is clearly. There won't be a status quo to settle into this season, I don't think. Because things are going to have to be constantly pushing forward because of the way they've put so many combustible elements into this situation. Um, 
So it's going to have to combust unreasonably soon. So you sort of got yourself into a situation where you don't really have a lot of time to have them, you know, just visiting random cars and having individual adventures because ultimately there's a bigger story at play and it's a story with a certain amount of urgency. Uh, whereas in previous seasons, it's like, ah, we'll travel through the cars and your number will slowly go down. And there's no, like, you know, there's no, there isn't a, such, a, such an urgency to this. But this is like, we've got to get her back to the apex. We've got to separate her from Tuba. Um, but also it's like, how oh, how's that going to explode? What's going to happen with Grace like this? Because um, we'll come back to Grace in a second. But obviously we've had an answer to my question of which character is going which way, um, I think, in this episode, but we'll talk about that in a bit. But my point is, in terms of the uh, structure of a normal season of Infinity Train, because of the, uh, the so, for lack of a better term here, the urgency of the narrative they've crafted, the sort of immediacy of it, it all just sort of has to play out and play out soon in the long, it, you can't, if you did a lot of like, oh, here we are in the, 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 the you know, the, the Springs car, where there are Springs everywhere stories, then you sort of, you sort of, you'd start going. Well, wait a minute! All this building tension you've got, you can't. It'll dissipate. So you've got to pay it off sooner rather than later. So um, I think this is one of a few, only a couple of episodes we're going to get this season that follow this old structure of they go into a car, and they have to play along with the car to get the door. Um, I don't think we're going to see too many of those this year. Um, I could be wrong. But I, 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 I don't think so. And what's interesting about this as well is it's like it's kind of got this interesting... Or if we do see that, it's going to be very, very background to whatever's actually occurring. And what's interesting about this episode as well, I really thought it was an interesting idea to do that kind of a story from the perspective of the Apex. So, you know, your Jessies or your Tulips go into that car and it's like, you've got to dance together. They're like, oh, fun, let's do that. Like, that, they don't even question it. It's just cool you know off on our exciting adventure i get to do some dancing some fancy dancing um but here it's immediately they feel in they feel because of their belief system they feel threatened they feel trapped it, they they are seeing a more sinister thing and this idea of teaming up the apex with hazel and tuba it really exposes that contrast of how they see the train versus how a normal passenger sees the train. Now, I know I'm pretty confident Hazel isn't a normal passenger, but for all intents and purposes right now, she's, she's playing the role of one. And I think that's what's really interesting because it's it, it allows you to sort of go, they're like, oh, we're trapped. Oh, no, what are we going to do? These these, these, they, these things are dangerous. Let's sneak out. Let's break free. Let's let's trash the place. Let's, let's, let's subvert this somehow. And they're just like, we could just do the dance like they don't seem very threatening like it seems like we just do the dance they give us the door that seems easier and less risky than you know becoming aggressors in this situation um and because hazel and tuba both kind of feel that way to keep them on side grace Sido goes okay we'll we'll cover both bases then we'll learn the dance to get us out of this car and you can uh and, 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 you know, and Simon's going to see if he can, like, sneak out, you know. But when that doesn't work either, it sort of leaves them with that one option but to play play the car's games. Um, so, yeah, that is the basic plot for anyone who doesn't remember this episode. If you're listening to this in the future or you haven't seen the episode recently, uh, well, that, that would be the same thing, I suppose, because the episode's only come out recently from my perspective. But, yeah, basically, they, um, they're forced into the car. They dance their way out. And then as they leave, there's a very interesting moment where Grayson shows her number decreasing, which I'll come back to. But um, in terms of the car itself, I think it's one of my favorite cars. I, it's what a great, brilliant... Well, first of all, voice work. Alfred Molina as the... Uh, as I don't even know the character's name. The, the sort of chandelier that dropped one of its balls and it turns into like another chandelier type thing in a, in a, in a half of a suit. Like, what a... Just a brilliant thought out designed one of the most creative cars we've seen like it's just so different to most of the cars we see in this show um, and I really love that I like yeah the tone of it uh, the style of it the way they've made it not just like because you could just go out to debutante's ball car and it's like all fancy and they have to dance and it's just like normal people standing around but they're like squid people and like the other things that are talking to them are like parts of like this 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 rustic almost like like rustic furniture come to life it's got like a magical beauty and the beast type vibe to it like i just everything about this car like appealed to me i just thought it was a really cool 
visual it was just great to look at um the whole time and even when they went into the room i liked that they visually had put all the steps on the floor and i liked that when they completed the dance they all sort of glowed and sparked I thought that was a neat visual too um there's a, there's a ton of stuff about this episode visually that i just think really strongly worked and it's one of those cars as well where it's such a simple premise like the kick the toad car from the previous season which just allows them to really focus on the character stuff because the car isn't hogging up a bunch of the plot because because you could get a really complicated puzzle car and then it's just gobbling up plot because the characters have to figure that out and while they're figuring that out you know what they're not doing eh, they're not talking about their feelings or they're not growing or, they're, or they can but it's alongside that and you're wasting words on just the physical explanations of what's happening um, an episode I can think of that maybe had a little bit of that going on, although that was intentional, so it's not a criticism, but the Map Car episode last year, they weren't quite ready to reveal what was going on with Jesse yet, so instead we got the Map Car episode where it was like 60% of them talking about their actual circumstances and how they get out of it, and then a little bit of, you know, heart, you know 20% like action or whatever, and then another whatever remaining percent is, you know, just of, of Jesse sort of hinting at his issues but not really outright clarifying so whereas this episode the plot like once they get in that car there's actually not a lot to discuss other than whether they're going to play along or not once they figure that out it's just it's lots of opportunity for the characters to talk and share um and how you balance an episode time wise when you've only got 10 minutes is really important because uh, a five to ten percent uh, swing towards more character stuff makes a big difference when it's 10 minutes because that's a whole minute of your episode <laughs> you know um it's it's so it's yeah it, it adds up pretty quickly um so yeah it, it, it can make a big difference and i think here it has done i think this episode gets more time to spend with the characters um as a result of having such a simplistic but very visually engaging car um so yeah so let's break it down in more detail i've got some stuff um so straight away we, well we don't actually start in the in the in the fancy dancing car to clarify we actually start in um like an under the sea type car which we see in the trailer which is pretty much i think what i predicted in the, the, the other episode which is like oh, it's going to start somewhere else and they're going to move into it um nice visually um i don't know what its deal was there's not really any indication that there's much of a challenge for them in there they just sort of passed through it which is fine that some, some cars seem to be like that not a criticism just an observation um gives them a chance to have a conversation though like tuba and hazel are playing and there's a really interesting conversation between uh grace and my boy Simon that completely changes my entire theory about the cat so I don't know how much of it I've spoke about on here or how much of it is just me like on Twitter like talking to people but I did posit the theory that the cat and Amelia were previously companions of, of a sort um, if I haven't got into detail on the theory here the basic premise was it was kind of like why was the cat helping Amelia in season one the answer initially they were traveling together and as amelia's problems didn't get better but got worse the cat tried to help couldn't and then felt a certain amount of responsibility to amelia when she went off the deep end so it's a mixture of fear of this of her you know as the new conductor with all the power she wielded combined with a feeling of responsibility so her that was the idea i had in my head for why the cat sort of a more complicated reason that the, 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 the cat helped out Amelia. But um, I have completely changed my mind. One line right at the top of this just completely flipped my theory on that because uh, I think Grace says to Simon, I don't, I've not got the exact quote written down, but I think it's just something like, um, when you first got on the train, you know, you had that null of yours. I think Simon traveled with the cat. I think that's why the cat had animosity, because I think Simon, after meeting Grace, betrayed the cat. And that's where he took his dragon radar. Boom. Theoried. Because it's definitely belongs to the cat. I, I refuse to accept that's not the cat. It's that little radar that tells you where, you know, everyone is on the train. Uh, I'll keep calling it the dragon radar because of <laughs> the resemblance. Um, betraying the cat would explain her animosity to him. It sets up that maybe before meeting simon she had a like a specific 
car and loop she was involved in and then sort of Simon sort of broke her out of that maybe which it does completely because there's no way she's been the companion to both Simon and Amelia if that seems unlikely um, so yeah I think the cat and Simon traveled for a while I think back then the cat didn't know or wasn't working with Amelia because they don't seem to be aware there's another comment shortly after this where they're talking to Hazel and they're setting up their belief system about the conductor and one one being this sort of false conductor or whatever which is full of you know untruths as we know they do reference the conductor very specifically being a he um they they use male pronouns multiple times and i think they even s describe them as uh like uh did i write it down i wonder if i did i doubt it i'm terrible for writing them. like my notes are good good at making <laughs> taking down my thoughts but they're not they're not great for actual like quotes from the show which i probably should do more of um sometimes i remember sometimes i don't uh, there you go oh they don't i didn't write it down no but yeah they basically described him as a man wearing a black helmet um who has the highest number no you know in the in the world <laughs> um uh, so it's kind of weird actually because how do they know about the high number but not know for sure the gender uh, because you feel like you to see that Amelia had such a high number, you'd have to see Amelia. <laughs> um, so it's kind of strange. So maybe they bumped into Amelia as the conductor. Well, we know Grace did because Grace says um, that the conductor saved her life once. Um, so maybe they're just taking the conductor on their word. I mean, we know the conductor, Amelia, had a big, you know, arm full of numbers and stuff going up to her neck. But they're basically saying no one knows where she is now. And, uh, well, no one knows where he is now, which makes Grace the person with the biggest number on the train and therefore the person that's leading the apex. So it seems like if, well, no, we'll come back to that later because that re relates to the end of the episode. We'll come back. That's, that's an important detail. So yeah, but because Grace kind of sets up that that's the reason she leads the apex. Yeah, so it's all a bit muddled, but I don't think this... I think all this indicates that there's no... There's, it's unlikely Amelia and the cat knew each other um, prior. Um, I feel like the cat just got sucked into the conductor's games because the conductor was sort of like bossing everyone around. Um, and the cat was sort of self-preservation over anything else and made those choices. Um, I think that makes more sense in the wake of Simon's companion potential companionship with the cat. But I'm really confident about that theory. Um, and there's a cat episode, like, I think, next. So, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. We're about to explore that. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's great. Um, saving Grace's life once is pretty interesting, but I don't really, like... Again, it's, it's all very vague in the right now. I'm sure it'll get explored further. I don't really have much to hypothesize about that at this stage, other than that at some point that indicates Grace has met that original conductor, but we kind of must have known that we kind of knew that anyway because otherwise how would they know the wave symbol you know how would they know that the old the old conductor looked like that or existed at all you know um so yeah um so there's a lot to take in just in the first few minutes of this before they even leave that uh you know that that under the sea car particularly there's another interesting sort of reminder of the situation they're in with tuba which is that uh to attack Tuba at this stage would be risky for both their lives and their relationship with Hazel, who they could lose, who they're hoping obviously to convert to their sort of way. Um, they still, they, they're still sort of like on this idea that you know one one is trying to get rid of the humans from the train, um, not really acknowledging the fact that new people arrive every day, um, or seemingly every day. Um, but they sort of Hazel's like, I hate one one when she to when they tell them that the kids are disappearing. And again, we're not even in the debutante ball car yet, and there's so much that's going on, but there's this really interesting moment that I think is relevant to what comes up later, where Tuba seems very concerned about the vanishing children. Like, what happens to them? Like, you know, it takes interest, which is... Tuba's mostly... Uh, Tuba's a really clever character, because Tuba doesn't speak very often, um, but when she does, it's, like with re it's because there's real purpose or need for it, and that's... There aren't enough characters like that on TV. Most characters on TV are like me and they blab their every thought and feeling immediately because that's just what happens um, so yeah Grace basically says I have the highest number just like the true conductor did so I'm the leader of the apex um, I make sure everyone's number stays high so she feels like she's protecting these kids from being vanished essentially but 
do you not think like they must no i think they think they think one one's lying don't they when one one says that gets them home hmm yeah kind of yeah there you go um I still think they've been warped by like some manifesto the conductor wrote Amelia. Um, but there you go. Um, I, Grace is being very manipulative in this episode, and I think it's one of the strongest parts of the episode. It's actually really cool that she basically, at the beginning, she sort of won't let. She kind of teases Hazel about joining the 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 Apex. She's like, Hazel, like, can I be? And she's like, mm, well, we only take like the best and the bravest and the most wonderful people and. Maybe someday you can join, which is like just creates desire in Hazel. Um, it's very subtle and very well done. Again, Grace is an absolute master manipulator of people. Um, she's she's very good <laughs> um, at knowing exactly when to give and when to not give. So I think that's pretty clever. And then that comes back towards the end of the episode when she um, when she does actually give uh, Grace the wave. Uh, not Grace, sorry, uh, Hazel, the, the 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 wave thing, because you know she makes it feel unattainable, and then by giving it to her after the adventure, that makes her feel special and wanted. Um, it's kind of genius, if I'm being completely honest. It's uh, yeah, super impressed. Also, you know, terrified, but super impressed with uh, with Grace in general. This episode's already far too long. There's too much going on, man, in this episode. I'll start trying to speed through my notes a bit quicker because we're already at like 20 minutes, which is bad. Um, I like the song. The song is cute. Um, I think there's an interesting hint that Tuba doesn't have kids anymore, that she used to. Um, I think it explains her overprotective attitude towards Hazel. Um, and it has this really... One of my favorite moments in this episode, actually, is the really sweet moment when she basically says she doesn't have anyone. And then he's like, don't be silly, you've got us, you know. Um, it's a really sweet moment. Really makes you feel for Tuba because you get the impression Tuba's been through some stuff. Um, what exactly? I don't know. Maybe, oh God, maybe, oh, really terrifying feel. Maybe the Apex were responsible for taking out her kids and she doesn't know that yet. They have been taking out wheel unwheeling nulls, presumably. Um, hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that makes her question earlier as well. Her interest in where are these children are going make a little bit more sense. Um, yeah, you're slowly learning more about Tuber and why Tuber is so affectionate for Hazel and why so she's so protective of Hazel. So it's expanding the characters in a really neat way here. Um, I've already talked about the car. How much I love that. I've got a lot of notes about that, but I sort of did that right up top. So I'll skip those notes. Uh, done that. I've done this kind of backwards, really. I talked about the debutantes walk on, then had to go back to all the stuff from before it. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that the, that the Apex see everything in, in, in the train as being sinister, when I actually see the train as being really neutral. Like, to a fault, but neutral. Like, it's just, it doesn't understand the humanity of things, so it's just very practical and pragmatic. And, you know, you need to be improved. We will look at your problems, and we will calculate how far away you are from being over that and you know we will base it we will judge your actions and calculate whether you are better or not like it's you know it, it, the, 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 the train is not a good thing who is it to judge anyone but it isn't inherently evil or good it's a it is a it is a neutral force in the sense of it doesn't there's no emotion or feeling behind any of its actions you know it's it's a yeah it's a it's it's not trying to hurt people. It's also not trying to help people. It's carrying out programming, which keeps me bringing me back to this idea of who is in control, who is who's 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 designed this. Uh, it feels it feels designed, and by a person, by a, by a being. Uh, who and why? Maybe we'll explore that at some point later in the show. Certainly not in this season, though. Um, there's too much going on otherwise. Um, so yeah, who, I liked the contrast between, already talked about this, but Tuba and Hazel. And actually, maybe I'm not as back, far through my notes as possible. I think I just covered a lot of them up top in the middle and I had to go back through. Um, yeah, there's a moment when like Hazel like grabs her like thing and she's like, I am special and brave. Um, and at that moment, Grace has an expression on her face that I thought gave away maybe some genuine 
sincere regret about how much she's manipulating Hazel. Um, just for a second. Hey, you know, because obviously telling, basically making Hazel feel like she's not special and brave with this whole Apex thing of like, oh, the Apex is special and brave. Uh, can I join? Maybe someday. You're not quite there yet. Like it's 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 almost like negging. <laughs> it's clearly she's <laughs> Grace read that book. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like I, and I think that for a moment when she sees what an emotional impact that's had on Hazel, when she's sort of like grabbing at her shirt and being like, I can be special and brave, I think that really does trigger a sincere feeling in Grace, and it might be the only sincere expression we've seen on her face since day bloody one, um, but there's just a moment that betrays it, that, in her expression, and then it's immediately, you know, she's back to, like, her, her apex sort of beliefs kick back in. And then shortly thereafter, she's like, these gnolls are a bigger threat than they seem. Uh, no, sorry. Simon says that. And then she, like, glances at Tuber and is like, yeah, they always are. So, you know, she doesn't last long. But I think that is a real hint towards what we get to at the end of the episode, which I promise, I know I keep referencing, but we will come back to. Uh, but then we get to all the dance stuff. Now, this is really interesting because uh, she doesn't remember, Hazel doesn't remember having a mom or a dad. Um, so I'm still getting, you know, Denizen vibes from that. Uh, you know, there's information in her code to tell her what dancing is and to give her the impression that she's had some sort of existence. I've taken dance classes, in quote marks, but no actual specific memories. Just the knowledge she's done it, but no actual memory of doing it or parents or anything like that. That feels very computer programmy to me, you know? Um, so... Like, a computer's version of giving somebody personality would be to say, you have had dance classes. But then not to supply the sufficient detail for them to then flesh that out. Uh, that feels like, a, like, oh, this is a person who has had dance classes in the little pro, you know, in like a digital profile. But again, not enough backing that up. I think it's interesting. It, really, it kind of upsets her. Um, I do sometimes wonder as well, if these these are all programs, like, are there, how real are their emotions? Like, how... You know, if you're telling me that, like, Atticus is a program, you know, that can be rewritten or overwritten at any point with that, sort of those cockroach monsters or whatever, then how real are any of his emotional responses to anything? And if Hazel is indeed a denizen, I have the same question. Uh, you know, it's something that I don't know if the show will explore, and they haven't really, they don't need to, they haven't, like, quizzed, they haven't questioned that. That's the thing is, so for people, when I was talking at the end of last season about how raising questions about the morality of this train in terms of the way it treats its denizens and how not free they are and that it's kind of almost a facsimile for systemic racism, the reason I bring that up is because the show kind of brought that up. That was Lake's plot last year, is that she was not, uh, this, uh, you know, she, there was a class system and she, as a denizen, somebody without a number, was unable to get free of the train. That is... You know that that's something the show was directly pointing out last season. So I expect and hope they will handle that because that's a question that the show is asking in the text. The show hasn't quite raised questions about the exact nature of the denizens yet in terms of their how they work and how close they are to real people. Like it, it's it's shown people that are making assumptions about them and they're basically made to be seen to be wrong but like we haven't the show isn't really directly saying what's the deal with these so uh, it's fine if they don't ever go into that detail they're kind of welcome to gloss over that if it makes the storytelling simpler but i would personally like them to explore that i think there's some interesting storytelling in there um it gives me vibes of that um that, that old star trek episode the uh Oh, the next generation one. The some uh, what's it called? One second. That's gonna kill me if I don't look it up. One second. Measure of a man. So there's an episode of Next Generation called Measure of a Man where like Data is a, who is a, an android. Um, they want to do. He's the only one of his kind, and they want to sort of take him apart to look at how he works. But there's a chance it'll erase his memories or damage him in some way. So he's like, mm, don't really want to do that. Um, and they're like, well, you're our property. You don't have a choice. So he basically ends up having to go to trial to try and prove he's a sentient being that has 
rights and thoughts of his own, and they're basically like, you're basically a toaster, <laughs> you know. You oh, well, not that some of them, but like some of the people further up at Starfleet. So it's up to like Picard to sort of convince them that Data's a human, basically. Um, so, and I think that's a really interesting plot, and I think the way they do that in that episode of Star Trek is really good. Recommend it uh, if you've got a chance to see. I think most of Star Trek Next Gen is on Netflix. In, is on Netflix in most countries, so I um, definitely recommend that episode. You don't. I don't think you need too much outside information to really enjoy that one either. Um, bit of a classic, uh, and those ideas definitely could become a theme and an idea later in the show. I think. They're, I don't know how relevant they are to the current season, and the, the, the creators could definitely get away with not necessarily needing to explore the exact nature of that beyond trust us, they're beings of their own. You know, like it's it's wrong to take away their free will, hurt them, wheel them, whatever. They're not nothing, as the Apex believe. That's really all the show. That that's really all the show needs to keep establishing which is what it's been doing um you know the exact nature of what they are who knows but they're definitely not nothing they're definitely not you know play things for the passengers um in the apex sense of the word or even in the original amelia sense of the word where she was trying to shape the train to meet her needs um yeah we get a little bit on we get a little bit of information on grace here um that really explains her entire personality a little bit um so she sort of talks to uh she sort of indicates she might have had a dance mom um she didn't go to classes with other kids she had a private instructor because her parents were sort of all about learning from the best i think is how she phrases it um which kind of left her lonely is the indication she doesn't get to play with other kids which might explain a lot about how she behaves now gathering these these this group around her that have put her on a pedestal she's kind of created that situation for herself for her own benefit um that might be why she's now become the leader of this big group of kids but it's all sort of that's also why it's somewhat false because she doesn't actually she never really had friends so she doesn't know how to actually be someone's friend she only knows how to pretend to be someone's friend which is exactly what she's doing she knows how to, she's learned how to manipulate as a self a self-defense mechanism rather than actually being able to befriend people for real. Um, and then she tells this kind of really sad story about the fact that when she finally did get to join a, a group a group class, um, they didn't, like, really want to know her, and they didn't really, like, they didn't invite her out to, I don't know, get ice cream or something after it. She said something, and I could, like, they went for milkshakes or something. I can't remember what it was. Uh, but they didn't invite her. And then she sort of, you see a switch... And then she sort of justifies it and rationalizes it as, oh, she was left out because they were jealous of her because she was way better. And that sort of explains her this this never-ending supply of confidence, of overconfidence that um, Grace has. You know, she she coped with her loneliness by learning how to fake it and manipulate people, but also explained it away as it was because she was better than them. And they were jealous, which has led to her being this overconfident person. It's really interesting. Um, it's definitely a real other dimension to Grace I wasn't expecting us to get. Maybe not even this, especially not this soon. Because um, that's way more detail, I think. Because I think you could make the argument, oh, well, you compared this to the map car episode, which, by the way, this is the, that is the ideal episode to compare this to. I think it is the third story in both seasons, and it's the first adventure they go on after the adventure where they meet. But I do think there's some key differences, because I think the map car hints... Oh, I suppose... Um, the more I think about it, the more I think that maybe I am wrong about comparing those two, because actually... We've gotten a hint at her personality here, not the exact reason she got on board. And with Jesse, that was the same situation. That swim team situation gave us a hint at his personality, but wasn't the exact reason he was on the train. That came an episode or two later when we saw the, how he treated his little brother. So I actually, you know what, maybe I was wrong right up top when I was talking about those two episodes being different because this one had more space to get in more in depth. It had more time to explain it in whatever, because well, Jesse and Tulip get that one like exchange on the boat about his passwords. I guess this is just one exchange between Hazel and Grace while Simon's out of the room, and it doesn't really come up again. Ah, oh, damn. I've disproved myself 20, uh, 30 minutes in. 
holy hell, 34 minutes in. How can I still be talking about the show? That is that is crazy. Um, so, yeah, I, I loved this episode for how much of Grace's personality it really justified. Uh, justified is the wrong word. Explained. I understand Grace now. She's not justified. She's, she's understandable. And that leads me to one of my big final points. Because I think... Grace, I've talked in the last episode, the last two episodes, I think, maybe now, that we were going to see these characters split. One of them was going to become, was going to change and grow, and the other was going to double down on their uh, apexiness. And I now truly believe that Grace is going to go down that path. Um, and I think Simon is the one that's going to double down. And I think the way it might even play out is that Grace's number keeps going down, so she starts hiding it. At a certain point with the glove, it's going to become apparent that her number has gone down, and it's going to go down low enough that that technically, by their logic, makes Simon the leader, and he's going to want to, you know, wheel tuba. He's going to want to. He's he's the more aggressive. He's not as smart as Grace, basically, in terms of how he's going to handle these things, and it's probably going to blow up in his face which is unfortunate. But I do think Simon's actually sort of going to become a villainous character as a show. I don't know if they're going to. I don't know if they're going to redeem him. I think he's going to double down and become essentially the antagonist of the show, of the season, I should say. Um, uh, great. So there are two ways that Grace sort of... So we got the backstory. We understand why she is like she is. This is really a Grace episode, I suppose, when you think about it. We also get the moment where her expression sort of betrays her. She feels guilty for, for, for manipulating Hazel the way she's manipulating her. And then the third moment... It's right towards the end, and it's right before her number goes down, where Tuba looks sad as she sees Hazel going off with Simon. She feels like she's losing Hazel. Grace notices this, remembers that Tuba has already lost kids, and is affected by that and feels some form of remorse. You can see it on her face, and that's when her number goes down. So I think, yeah, I think that's where we're... I think that's where we're going um, with this. Um, yeah. Um, in other notes, just very quickly, um, the black side, black void outside the building um, was a really neat idea. The idea that once they're in there, like this, there's nothing outside the building itself. The building is the car, so you have to get out the way you go. Um, I liked. I thought it was cute that Simon was kind of blushing when he was dancing with Grace. I do think he has a thing for her. But I think he's going to get over that pretty quickly when he finds out, or when he sort of when they come to blows about handling Hazel. I also forgot actually when I've been I, I'd forgotten while I've been talking about all this that in the trailer we hear it's Grace that says the line. Do we really want to bring her back to the apex in the sense of like, you know, do we want to put her through that? She's too maybe too sweet for this. Maybe she's not right for it. Um, that was powerful. Uh, that, uh, it's a powerful line in the context of this episode because you sort of hints where they're going to be going. Um, I thought the whole dancing sequence was super adorable. Um, I love their little costumes, all of them. They were, they look amazing. I got how cute is little Hazel in a top hat and tails? It's, it's incredible. It's just a tuba with a little shawl thing draped over. Man, that's the honestly, it's the most adorable thing about this episode. Um, and I like all the little comments from the crowd, kind of judgy and high society-ish. Super fun. Uh, but at the end of the episode, when they give, when they finally give Hazel the uh, the, the, the the apex wave. She's like, now Tuba. And they're like, mm, no, it's only for passengers. So, again, we're just heightening and poking at that tension that exists there. Um, I also thought it was interesting at the end that obviously Simon at the end is like asking Hazel to teach him the song. Because that kind of shows he's not completely blind to how Grace works. He is picking up. He's not as good at it. And he he'll let his emotions over, you know, overtake him. And he'd be like, well, of course the tuba can't come with us, but instead of like doing what Grace does, which is she internalizes everything first before she speaks, she's very smart like that. He will open his mouth before he's had a chance to think, but occasionally he does show that he's learned some of her manipulation tactics. Him, Simon walking off with uh, Hazel at the end of the episode, being like, oh, teach me that cute song, you know, was very much, you know, he, uh, we, we, well, with the, I mean, it's there mostly, I think, to show us, to set up the, the tuba situation. You know, a tuba sees, it feels like she's losing Hazel to these two. But it does also give us that little moment of, oh, okay, Simon's not <laughs> completely inept. He's just not as good at it as Grace or as good at 
consistently keeping it up as great. Um, so yeah, I think there's a there is a hell of a lot. Um, there's a hell of a lot going on. Obviously, there are many dimensions to all of this. Um, so I hope my breakdown hasn't been like too hard to follow because I feel like I've been all over the place discussing it. But it's really interesting to analyze, particularly Grace's character stuff from this week. Um, so yeah, I hope this has been enjoyable to listen to and not just genuinely maddeningly unorganized thoughts. Because I mean, that is what this is. That I've I've just learned to accept that random rambling is just my unorganized thoughts. But I do sometimes worry that I go too far and that it's like because it is just a stream of consciousness and just me rambling about the thing I just watched, you know, that I worry that, like, it makes it quite hard to follow. Um, so I hope that's not the case. I'm not going to change, let's be honest. I'm not capable of change. <laughs> my, number's, my number's been the same for several years. Uh, um, but I, uh, I do hope you guys are getting something out of it and it helps you sort of... Uh, I listen to some podcasts like this and, and, the, and the reason I enjoy them often is or what I get out of them uh, is you know helps me sort of settle on my thoughts even if i don't agree with the thoughts of the person speaking about the thing it's that's in itself helps me understand where i stand on it because then i go okay no i don't agree with that so then i feel like this uh but sometimes when i finish watching a show that i think is got a lot of a lot going on or it's very com not complicated but like there's there's a lot of layers to it and i want to break it down like it really helps me sort of listening to other people discuss these things and review these things really does sometimes help me sort of understand how I feel about it and help me sort through my thoughts. Um, so what I really could use is someone else to be doing this. Then I watch their video and then do mine and then it would be more coherent. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for sticking with me. I know this has been long. 41 minutes is absurd for this show, um, especially for such an early episode in the season, which traditionally end up only being like 20 minute discussions. But um, there's a lot going on, obviously. Um, this is by far the best season the show has done so far. I've never been quite this invested and I love the show. I've always did. Like from minute one, I was into the show. From the pilot, I was into the show, but I think it's... Uh, it is growing into quite an obsession for me now, so it's uh, it's it expect me to continue with content on Infinity Train um, as it goes because it is it's becoming a real favorite of mine. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for listening, and I will see you guys uh, next time. Um, what is the next episode called? Uh, I can't remember. Oh, I can. It's the it's the cats one. Exactly how is it phrased? Let me bring it up quickly. -na -na -na. Right here we go. Um, Le Chat Chalet Car, which is the, the cat's house, I guess, car, or the cat's chalet car. Like, it's a, so I, I, I'm start The way a chalet traditionally, though, when I think of a chalet, I think of like, like that, like a, like a, like a cabin on a snowy top. So I wonder if it's in the snow car. Um, because that, when I picture a chalet, I think of, I picture like a skiing trip in the south of, maybe not south of France, wherever it snows in France, like a, like a French skiing resort. Um, you know, up in like the mountains or something like, and it's like uh, maybe not French, like I don't know, somewhere in like the Alps or something. Like that's what I think of when I think of a chalet. So, um, I wonder if the shot, because the because we've established that last trailer was probably shots from the first five episodes. I don't know where else the snow thing fits in because it's probably not going to be in the 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 color clock car. We've seen the clips of that. That's kind of that room full of colorful shapes. Um, so the only real place left for that scene to appear is in this episode and because i connect chalets to snowy kind of mountaintops and skiing i wonder if that's inside there um, so just does the cat have a holiday home inside the, the 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 snow car from previous episodes or is it a different car altogether it could just be a different car it looks very similar in the trailer but it could i suppose be a different car um who knows we'll find out uh, so yeah i've talked too long thank you so much and i'll see you uh, in a day or two's time when I discuss Le Chat Chalet Car. Le Chat Chalet Car? Yeah, we're gonna go with that. Le Chat Chalet Car. Excuse my pronunciation. <laughs>